Uh, this morning we're going to be reading from Psalm 139, where I got that children's message. And this is a psalm, sometimes attributed to David, the king, and at least in the Bible it is. And it's got a, a couple of lines in it that are a little bit scary, but everything else is really wonderful. And I'm not one to take out the hard part. So I have left the part in where he says he hates God's enemies and wants them to die. So um, we all have you know, thoughts and things that eventually over time, maybe God will help us see differently. But these are the words from the original Psalm. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. I know them very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, and when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end, I am still with you. Oh, that you would kill the wicked, O God, and that the bloodthirsty would depart from me. Those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Chuck. Let us pray. God of Sabbath rest, as we hear your word interpreted and shared, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Speak to us right where we are about the things that we need to hear. Then prepare our hearts for the days ahead so might, we might journey with more love, more light, and more peace. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Psalm 139, I think, is kind of like a treasure chest. It's one drawer you might open and find these pearls of comfort from God saying, I'm with you everywhere. You can't go anywhere that I'm not already there. And another drawer might hold nuggets of peace where you know that God made you and formed you and knows everything about you and Whatever you can think or say, the Lord is there knowing you and accepting you. In Florence, Italy, there's another great treasure. It's in the, the gallery of academia. It's a marble statue of a human body, and here it is. So I didn't include the whole thing because if I did, it might be against the rules in church. Because if you've seen the whole thing, it's a 17-foot statue of King David as a young teenager, right before he is going to sling his slingshot and knock down the Goliath. And so you can see his sling on his shoulder there and in his other hand is the stone. I did get to see a replica in London 
Um, it was given to Queen Victoria, and she had a fig leaf made that hung on it whenever she or women went to see it. It is a majestic piece of art. It's called one of the greatest masterpieces that ever has been made by human hands. And it's a beautiful image of humanity and human form. So think about King David's words. You knit me in my mother's womb. You wove me in the depths of the earth, which some think also refers to the mother's womb. That God beheld him before he was born. So like David, like us, this psalm today is meant to speak to us in the words that he uttered or um, the author of this psalm about how we were made, how we are known. I don't think I've ever heard this sermon preached. I don't think I've ever heard much talk about human bodies in church. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on today because God loves our physicality. God made our physicality. And this artist who sculpted King David knew human bodies. He had studied them, and he had even gone so far as to dissect them, medically dissect them, to know everything about them. And he believed that in the stone or in the marble, the big slab that was longer than 16 feet when he began it, he believed that the statue or the person was in the marble that God had created in the marble and that he would work to bring him out. We're talking about Michelangelo. Michelangelo was the son of a banker, one of several sons. When he was born, his mother got sick and he was taken to a, a wet nurse, someone who could nurse him in a stonecutter's family. What a great um, way that something kind of bad turned out kind of good. He became a painter's apprentice at age 13, and then he studied sculpture. And at 26, he finished this beautiful sculpture, this beautiful statue. That was in 1504. And he had sculpted only one thing before that, and then, of course, many things after that, including lots of painting, like the Sistine Chapel. You can take the slide down, because I'm afraid it's going to trump me in... Um, what you're going to look at. <laughs> so he portrays David as the, as the young man, and the Bible says that David was good looking. It says he had a ruddy complexion and bright eyes. When it talks about him being chosen to be the king, it talks about how he was good looking. When this statue was finished in 1504, it was too good looking for where they planned to put it. They planned to put it up on the cathedral way up where you could see it, um, but they decide to put it down in the public square. And so David says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And there it is now in Florence still, but now in a museum for anyone to see. There's something almost too wonderful about the connection uh, between God's vision and Michelangelo's vision. I think it's pretty astounding. And so I wonder for you or for me, when did we maybe lose that vision of the beauty of the physicality of our bodies? So maybe that vision is firmly in you, but maybe like for me, it's really not really attached like that. And so I wonder if I could share with you what this Psalm has said to me this week as I've been thinking about our physicality and maybe there's a pearl or a nugget here to take home. The first thing the psalm says to me is that our bodies were made by God. So in other parts of scripture, we read about the potter and the clay. And everyone's kind of heard about the potter and the clay. But notice in this scripture where David's talking, it's about the weaving and the knitting. Isn't that neat? So... I think about what I've learned about biology and my, one of my daughters-in-law is a high school biology teacher taking some time off to raise the kids. How many bones do you think our body has as an adult? How many? 206 is right. Are you 
You, have, you don't have your hands on your phone? Very good, okay. Then how many hair follicles on your body? Hair follicles. Guess, guess. Five million. Five million, about the same as on a chimpanzee, but not as furry. There's about 100,000 on your head. Um, with natural blondes, having more. Redhead's the second most. And uh, black or brown hair having the least. 37 trillion cells in your body, all of which need the breath of life to continue to exist. So if you believe that God made this body that you have, and if you believe what the Psalm says, that God designed it uniquely and personally for you, then I think you would have to believe, and this is something I struggle with, that your body is beautiful. And you would have to not believe what culture says, that only some bodies are beautiful. I think I mentioned in a sermon a couple times ago that I uh, watched an interview where Ellen DeGeneres asked Sandra Bullock some questions. And one of the first few questions was, what is your favorite body part? And um, as the audience waited with expectation, she said, my shoulders. And Ellen said, really? And she said, yes. And then they talked about how they had the same trainer and how Ellen's shoulders were getting better too. Culture is um, constantly lifting up a certain body image. Depending on the culture you live in, it's gonna be different here in the United States. In the South, it might be different from the North or the West from the East. But I think we could all agree that there is bias towards bodies that have stereotypical beauty. So this scripture um, would go against that. This scripture would say that that's a sin, that that's a separation from God and from God's word to believe that your body is not equally as beautifully designed, as lovely as anyone else's. So as I was pondering this over the weekend, I got the courage to go bathing suit shopping. <laughs> I said, what better time when I have just written that down to go bathing suit shopping. Well, it was a disaster as usual. <laughs> I did get one. Um, first I went in a surf shop, this is not on here, um, and I saw that they were only for people age uh, size nine and under in the juniors, so I had to go to Dillard's, and you know, there's a whole section for older ladies, um, and I'll stop there. <laughs> but <laughs> fighting against um, a body image idea whether it has to do with um, age or size or wrinkles or gray hair or um, my least favorite body part, um, stomach, um, is we need this corrective of this scripture. And I hope if you pull out the treasure chest and take a nugget out of it, it will be that you are beautifully designed and your body is lovely. So, if you believe that God made our bodies and designed them and thinks they're lovely, the next step is what do you think about other people? How do you judge? Do you find yourself judging? I do. I was in Publix a couple of days ago and there was a lady in front of me taking up the whole aisle, not with her body, but with her cart going slowly. And then I realized that she had a trouble walking. And then I realized that I had judged. And then I realized that I'd better slow down and walk behind her and think about her with God's thoughts and God's eyes. So what would the world be like? What would our individual worlds be like if we looked at other people with God's eyes? We looked at their bodies, even whether they were not our stereotypical image of someone we want to walk faster or look different, what would that be like? And if you believe that God made our bodies and loves and cared for them and thinks they're lovely, 
The last thing is that, isn't God still working on us? Isn't God still working on us? And I'm not necessarily talking about that diet that um, I'm on about 20% of the time, some particular diet, this time Weight Watchers. God has built into your body this amazing thing to replace um, your skin every couple of years, all your cells. Unless you have cirrhosis, your liver is regenerated over a period of time that is not that long. So, um, um, unless you have been a very heavy drinker and even then um, there is hope, you can change things about what you do anytime and your body will receive them, your lungs, everything. So one of my most frequent prayers to God is that God will lead me to make more healthy choices day by day and hour by hour. Um, I don't really like apples, but I do like to grab blueberries for dessert sometimes instead of the ice cream with the um, chocolate swirls. And yes, I do like to put cool up on top of it and occasionally a liqueur. Um, so more healthy choices, I think God can help us with day by day. My personal story, and when I was 49 years old and I'm 63 now, I was encouraged by a friend to go to a yoga class for the very first time. And I believe now that that was the Holy Spirit working in me and for me because I went to look a certain way and after a few weeks, I realized that that didn't matter and that was the greatest gift that it gave me. I've been teaching now for nine years and I've seen yoga mend broken hearts just because people are moving in healthy ways. A father who lost a 12-year-old son came nine years ago and is still coming. Um, I've seen people from ages five in the studio up to 90 um, benefiting from this. So it is also scriptural finally that these bodies we're talking about, that they're not permanent. So King David, his statue's there, but he's been gone a couple of thousand years. I think this is a hard thing to struggle with. Our bodies that are fearfully and wonderfully made are not, are temporary. So I'm a little bit encouraged by this story. Six days before he died at age 88, Michelangelo spent all day sculpting his last sculpture and almost got it finished. Over the years, the physical work had taken a toll on his body. He could feel it. He said that in a poem once that drawing on the Sistine Chapel ceiling for a couple of years can really take it out of you. But out of this last block of stone, he brought back to life his first sculpture. It's called the Pieta, or the Pity. His very first sculpture was Mother Mary holding the crucified dead body of her son, Jesus. And that was the last one that he sculpted. He was a believer, and many say that he saw human life in that body, but not just dying, arising again in the resurrection. He said this, and I love this, it is well with me when I have a chisel in my hand. And so I realize that we're made to work and play with our physical bodies. We're made to be amazed at them and others. But there'll be a time when we lay the chisel down, the last time. And that's where the rest of this psalm really speaks to me. If I go to heaven, you are there. If I go to the depths of Sheol, you are there. If I go in the wings of the morning to the farthest place, you are there. Even to you, darkness is light. And that is where I find my greatest hope, that these temporary bodies are lovely, but something lays ahead that's even lovelier. And to glory be to God for that. Amen.